I'm an expert on revolutions more than social movements, but the two are very much alike. Revolutions, after all, begin with social movements, and those who are behind social movements frequently have bigger goals in mind. But I'm going to talk today about what I see as the differences between protest movements and revolutions, and in that context, how I view last year's protests in Russia. The title of my talk now has four years. I've added a couple. So 1848, 1968, 2011, and 2013. In 1848, revolutions spread across Europe. They followed splits, I'm sorry, they followed a spike in food prices and the expansion of cities and of higher education. These revolutions were initially led by students and professionals in the major cities particularly the capital cities, Berlin, Vienna, Paris. They demanded constitutions and an end to long-standing authoritarian regimes. And they had some success. In France, after 1848, there were no more monarchies. There was an empire under Napoleon III, but the reign of the Bourbon monarchs was essentially over. Um, there were some modifications to the monarchies in the Austrian Empire and in Germany. The kings remained in power, but the ministers embarked on reforms. Still, in most places, military and external intervention produced successful counter-revolution. So we tend to think of 1848 as a year of unsuccessful or aborted revolutions. And let's jump forward a century. In 1968, riots and protests spread across the post-World War II democracies. There were particularly large events in <laughs> Chicago in the United States, in Paris and France. And these protests also followed a long period of expansion in higher education, but also long periods of economic growth in the 1960s. These protests were led by students and other young people, again in the cities, and they demanded a change to state policies, more rights and responsiveness to students, to minorities, and to workers, and compliance with popular demands, especially to get out of the war in Vietnam in the United States. But there was a common element of these protests, and that was they attacked the arrogance of democratic leaders who seemed increasingly out of touch. <laughs> Lyndon Johnson in the United States and Charles de Gaulle in France. These protests were successful in the sense that de Gaulle uh, was forced to change his course. Johnson was forced to give up his plans to seek re-election. And so these overreaching democratic rulers were reminded that in a democracy, the voice of the people at the end of the day is the most important factor determining what they can or cannot do. But these were not revolutions. There was a lot of excitement at the time. People talked about 1968 as a revolutionary year. But in fact, the differences with 1848 were quite clear. The protesters were not seeking to overthrow long-established authoritarian regimes. They were not demanding new constitutions. What they were demanding was an expansion and greater respect for democratic rights in democracies that were coping with expanded middle classes and the results of greater economic growth and a more uh, vibrant and articulate youth cohort. Now, let's look at another pair of years, 2011 and 2013. The 2011 Arab revolts clearly fit the pattern of 1848 in Europe. Again, we have popular protests led by young people and professionals in the cities seeking democracy and new constitutions to replace long-standing authoritarian regimes. 
Also, as in 1848, the results have not been what people hoped for. Instead of a smooth transition to democracies, what we have seen is extended conflict. And just as in 1848, a combination of military and external intervention has produced counter-revolutions, most completely in Bahrain and Egypt, but certainly also to some degree in Syria, and we await to see what will happen in Libya, where the militias and Islamists are contending for power. Tunisia appears to have the best chance of moving forward. Um, but again, like in 1848, what we see is protest movements with a revolutionary goal leading to diverse outcomes. 2013, we saw protests in 2012, 2013 in Russia and in spring of 2013 in Turkey and Brazil. Now, again, people were excited by these protests and said, wow, what is going on? Is this the uh, Turkish spring? Some commentators said in Istanbul. Is Brazil having a revolutionary moment? Uh, given the long tradition of coup and revolution in Latin America, you can forgive people for being concerned. But commentary has now, I think, increasingly come to the view that these were not revolutionary movements, but what happened was actually much more like what happened in 1968 in France and the United States. That is, we see a clash between spirited young populations and an expanded middle class with democratically elected leaders who had grown arrogant, out of touch, and were embarking on projects that people disapproved of. And so in Turkey, uh, Erdogan's plans to destroy a park in the middle of Istanbul provoked popular protests. In Brazil, the uh, neglect of promises made to invest in public infrastructure and extraordinary heavy spending in preparations for the uh, World Cup and Olympic Games that outraged people for the waste of funds led to popular protests. And of course, uh, as was said, in Russia, uh, outrage at the kind of blatant manipulation of the elections for the Duma led to protests here in Moscow. Um, but again, in all of these cases, even Russia, we are dealing not with long-standing, unchallenged authoritarian regimes, but countries that have recently admitted greater degrees of electoral and democratic competition. In Turkey, the AKP is a dominant party, but they won their domination through electoral competition, and they continue to operate by the ballot. It is true that in recent years there have been disturbing authoritarian tendencies, policies that seem to run roughshod over pluralism, secularism, and aggressive criminal prosecution of political enemies. All of that aroused fear and concern among the Turkish middle class. And when the fate of a popular park was on the line, popular protest erupted. And it was clear that the protest was not simply a matter of people in Istanbul being attached to a park. It was really a question of this was a line in which people felt they could make a stand to push back against an elected government that they felt was no longer responsive to popular demands, no longer sufficiently attentive to rule of law and to what people expected. And similarly in Brazil, people felt that the raising of bus fares was kind of the last straw in a government that, although it had been popularly elected and was very popular under the rule of uh, Ignacio Lula de la Silva, under his more technocratic successor, President Rousseff, um, the government was seen to be increasingly following its own plans without regard for the impact on ordinary Brazilians, leading eventually to protests. Now, in Russia, you may say that, well, the Russian political system has little that is democratic about it. Mm -hmm. But in comparison to the communist regime, it is in a state of progress in that 
the government does desire to win elections. It does desire popular support. And it has been interesting to watch its reactions to the protests. Initially, it seemed that the response to the protests would be a return to a harsh, almost Stalinist approach. One saw trumped up trials, uh, extraordinary punishments, criticism of the government being treated as treason to be prosecuted. And it seemed that there was going to be a um, real sharp movement backward to a harsh authoritarian style. And yet this spring, something shifted. It seemed that some people in government, perhaps Putin himself, decided that this was not the direction to go, that this might be counterproductive. And so we saw the mayoral candidate Navalny released and allowed not only to run, but actually to conduct a campaign in Moscow with kiosks and handouts and a competition that if not fully free and fair, certainly manipulated in many ways, was nonetheless one of the most free elections for major office to have occurred in Russia. It seems that even though we see some overreaction in Turkey, the government initially responded to protests with water cannon and human rights violations, but eventually decided in a fairly short time that this was counterproductive and backed off. In Russia, we again see the overreaction at first, the return of a harsh, uh, powerful authoritarian hand, but again, a reversal and the permission of a relatively open election in Moscow. So what does this direction, this shifting, tell us? It could simply be a matter of confusion at the top. You can't rule that out. I always tell people, when you think you see a conspiracy, you may be simply seeing indecision or incompetence. But I do believe that what we're seeing in all of these cases, in Brazil, in Turkey, in Russia, is the development in these countries of a middle class that has become both essential for development and too self-conscious to be completely ignored. Now, what we have in Russia is, of course, a division between the situation in the cities and the situation in the countryside. The poorer rural population, as Arby mentioned, is largely apathetic. We don't have nationwide political mobilization. Uh, that is also somewhat true in Brazil and in Turkey, where it has been mainly the urban student and professional populations that have taken the lead in protest. So much depends in the future on what happens with civil society. Does it extend more broadly? Does it grow throughout the countries? Does it provide linkages between urban and rural populations in these large emerging economies? All of these economies, Brazil, Turkey, and Russia, have had problems with economic slowdown since 2009. The, so the simple promise of easy prosperity delivered by a powerful popular government no longer is as evident as it was before. So people are asking for answers. They're asking the government, what do you plan to do for the welfare of ordinary Brazilians or Turkish people or Russian people? How do you plan to curb the corruption that we can no longer afford in an era when resources are no longer so plentiful? How will you be more accountable and responsive in your capital spending? Now, these are not revolutionary questions. These are questions that are always asked in democratic governments. And I think what people overlook is the degree to which protest is an absolutely necessary and frequent component of well-functioning democracies. It's not the case that all protest is simply a precursor to revolution, and it's not the case that a well-functioning democracy can do without street protest and even riots. The reason for that is that elections, which are the main route by which people give feedback in democratic governments, are blunt instruments. They occur only at intervals of many years, and they do not allow a tight focus on specific issues. When you're voting for an official, you're voting usually on a broad platform of issues, and there's a national contest. So in a democracy, if people have strong feelings about a specific issue, and it's important to make those feelings known in real time, this matters today, this matters now, the only course is to take to the streets in popular demonstrations and demand that these events gain on the agenda 
In the United States, this has become so conventional that a march on the mall in Washington, D.C. is a fairly typical monthly event. Almost every month, we have some group or other apply for a petition and stage a protest march on the mall. It's become a normal part of our democracy. It only becomes exaggerated and extreme when the government responds with excessive force. This is what happened in Chicago in 1968 as well. When the police respond to a large demonstration with violence, they provoke violence in turn. The result is a more violent confrontation, at which point the authorities have to make a decision. Do we move in the direction of more severe authoritarianism, or do we recognize this is a democracy and make some concession to the protesters and try and tamp things down? And what has happened in Turkey, and surprisingly what happened even in Russia and in Brazil, is that the government has made concessions to try and avoid larger protests in the future. They have not altered their policies radically, but they've indicated a willingness to make tactical retreats, and that creates an opening. So I expect for the future in Russia, Brazil, Turkey, and other emerging countries, that as the middle class grows and as civil society deepens, we will see a jerky back and forth pressure to open political space, pressure to keep government more accountable. And we will see a series, I believe, of tactical retreats as governments realize that the professional middle class and students are necessary for their plans of economic development to go forward. This is sometimes known as the, the dictator's dilemma. You need to create talented professionals and a generation of skilled students in order to have a modern economy. But you also cannot have those groups without encouraging protest. So let me stop there because I'm very interested in hearing from you what you see as the depth and the future of protest in Russia, where you see civil society growing, where you see it being held back, and what the dynamics will be. So thank you very much for having me here to join you. And I look forward to being here for the next couple of days with you. of democratization, but I would say of tactical retreat. So um, I think it's, it, it would be very nice if it's to fit the Russian case neatly into um, a kind of brick model, as, as you seem to suggest, with you know, Russia, Turkey, and Brazil um, in the same boat. But I, I'm just not sure that it's entirely worn out by the evidence. And I'm not sure that what we've been seeing in Russia is a middle class and student protest. And I was wondering whether you think that invalidates what your argument. Well, I haven't read your book yet, so. I confess that your data uh, could let me change my views. 
My sense is the following, that as you say, it is much more complex. Obviously, in three or four minutes, I'm simplifying. Russia is a vast country, and things are going on in different ways all over. Uh, what I would say is this. I would say that the middle class and younger people were in the vanguard of the protest as initial organizers and communicators. Even in other countries such as Egypt, Brazil, and Turkey, the bulk of those who participated in the, in the movements and protests at their peak were a broad cross-section of society. Once things had begun, many people were drawn in to participate. And obviously, the feelings of discontent and grievance are much broader than those felt by the middle class in particular. I completely agree with you in that regard. The question is, where is the impetus coming from for the organization of civil society and for the mobilization of political opposition? Now, the middle class in Russia is very complicated. Many are just leaving. They're voting with their feet rather than engaging in protest. And what constitutes middle class, I think, is open for discussion. Um, I don't mean simply the uh, professional classes or those, the intelligentsia. Uh, I mean more broadly those people who are living in the 10 to 15 largest urban areas, which are a, kind of, which have been the main beneficiaries of economic advance uh, and job in improvement. Again, you, you, I may be wrong and I'm happy to see the data and, and be persuaded otherwise. But my sense is that there's been a bit of a uh, separation with the uh, population outside the major cities depending more on government jobs and government pensions and handouts and people in the 10 to 15 largest urban areas better able to develop their own small businesses, their own jobs, their own professions, and therefore gain a sense of autonomy vis-a-vis -vis the government. I mean, one of the problems of middle class is if you have a middle class that's very heavily dependent on the government and very drawn into the bureaucracy of government payments, they're much less likely to be vigorous in opposition than a middle class that sees itself as having a more independent base. So these may be nuances that, on which we can start to uh, uh, say, improve my argument. Um, yeah. Hello? Yes. Uh, I must say, um, to dance about the middle class, mm. uh, revolutions, or uh, not revolutions, but... Protests, say. Um, one is uh, related with the fact that sometimes I think we tend to see through the media the middle class uh, side, uh, more in evidence, but if you look at Tunisia or Egypt, what is impressive is the uh, degree of development of uh, working class uh, uh, <coughs> even before uh, the uh, years. So my impression is that uh, even if we want to look at uh, who took the streets first, we have to look at the combination mm -hmm. uh, of these two. And the other thing is what I've seen that uh, even in Western Europe, even if you take the Indianas and Greece and Spain, is the fact that it's, uh, it is even difficult to speak of the middle class because neoliberalism meant the war against the middle class. So what we see in this protest is impoverished sometimes. Middle class uh, is a middle class which has lost uh, uh, a lot of protections, welfare uh, uh, supports and so on. Uh, and so I'm also not sure that uh, it, uh, it helps us for the, uh, in the middle class. Fair enough. Um, let me try and rephrase what I was saying, because I, I appreciate your view. What you had in the Middle East, in countries like Tunisia and Egypt, you had a very large, maybe 30, 40 percent of the population whose economic fortunes had stagnated or declined for the last 10 or 15 years while they saw urban middle classes improve and a small corrupt crony class become enormously rich. The um, people like uh, Mohammed Bouazizi were not someone you would call middle class. They were people who were excluded from the middle class, struggling to create a basic existence with some dignity, something that had been really stymied by the growth of a corrupt core and the very unbalanced development. Now, you certainly have some of that also in, in Brazil, in Turkey. There's very differential development in different regions. But when I talk about middle class protest versus revolution, 
What I'm trying to capture is that the coalition that developed in Egypt, in Tunisia, in Libya, is a, <clears throat> a coalition with a very strong component of people who were angry at being economically kept down. They joined protests that had been initiated, in some cases, in the cities. Uh, the, the cause of the fruit vendor was taken up mainly in uh, the cities in Tunisia and grew from there. And it was not only workers' unions, but teachers' unions, police unions, all kinds of groups that joined lawyers demonstrating in the streets. So it always takes a broad coalition to make a revolution, but the broad coalition had much more revolutionary goals in those countries where they wanted really to eliminate what they saw as the leadership of society because they saw it being as irremediably corrupt and self-serving and criminal, whereas in Brazil and in Turkey, the movements kept to more middle-class goals. We want policies that will benefit ordinary people. Now, obviously, the bus fares were not an issue mainly for the middle class because the bus fares were much more important for working people for whom that was a big part of their income. But the language in which they couched their protest was, we want reform, we want change of laws, we want different policies, we want a chance for our incomes to grow, which is non-revolutionary demand. So that's the difference that I mean. You're absolutely right that all of these movements bring together coalitions, a diversity of goals. Now in Russia, I think the real question is, is the movement coalescing around a view of the leadership as so irremediably corrupt and criminal that they all have to be cast out? That would be a set of revolutionary goals. Or is it the case that Putin is still bearable if he changes his stripes? Can the system be modified? What are people really calling for? Is it a throw them out, we need a new system, or let's get rid of the worst corruption, let's improve rule of law, and let's get back on the track we were in? I, I tend to see that 1991 really was a revolution, but the goals of that revolution have not been fully met. In fact, there's been a lot of drift backwards, and so people, in a sense, are calling to finish the job that was started in 91, if you will. I, I don't know where to begin, so it, <laughs> it's, I, I really take issue with your, you see, your reading of 1968 <coughs> I find it difficult to see how you can talk about pr protest in the way you do in the role of the middle class, leaving out of the picture the civil rights movement, leaving out of the picture in Britain all through the protest movement. It's, work, it's been working class has been the key, the miners' strike, etc. Uh, in Europe, at least, the middle class is, a, is traditionally the conservative force. And it has been for the revolutions. In America, protest, it's a different matter to go on a protest, a march on Washington than it is to take part in a march where actually the police are going to beat you up really badly. In 1968, they would beat you up badly in America. I remember the first march I went on in America, and it was frightening compared with the march in London. And now, actually, the police in London beat you up. <laughs> so I think we really do, I, I think we really do need to look much more carefully or closely than you do at what constitutes protest in different societies and at different times. The question that puzzles me about Russia today and I would like an answer to is why are the students so passive? Why were they passive in 1991 and they still are today, although Russia has changed hugely? That would be one question. And the other question would be about the dealing with protest. Um, is it dealt with differently now, and if so, what are the reasons? I don't see the middle class here being relevant at all. Hmm. Again, obviously we may be speaking of different things when we talk about the middle class. If you talk about the civil rights movement, and, and I do mention the minorities as an element in 68, the <coughs> civil rights movement was led by black professionals who were middle class by the standards of their communities. 
So Martin Luther King and even um, Rosa Parks, these were people who had uh, higher levels of jobs and education. Now, in a sense, it's always the case in both revolutions and protests that the leaders are generally more educated and a higher status than the rank and file. And as I say, for me, I'm trying to differentiate between two things that are somewhat similar, protest and revolution. A lot has to do with who pushes the goals, who keeps command of the agenda, who manages to retain control of the strategy. Certainly, uh, Vladimir Lenin came from a middle class family as well. But he was pushed, uh, he and Trotsky were both pushed into more radicalism than they expected by the workers uh, of Petrograd and, and Moscow. Um, the civil rights movement in the United States retained its focus on fighting for constitutionalism, fighting for legal rights. There were other groups in the civil rights movement, certainly the Stokely Carmichael and the Black Panthers who wanted a more violent and revolutionary approach. But they remained, for the most part, somewhat to the side of the mainstream of the civil rights movement. Now, the, the people who assisted the Freedom Riders were middle class students who went to the South. The student free speech, free speech movement in Berkeley was led by a generation of students who were often the first students in their uh, families to have gone to the university. I mean, I, I may not look old enough, but I do remember uh, marching in San Francisco myself and getting uh, chased by police, and my sister was tear gassed in Paris. So you're right, protest can be confrontational and violent. And as I said, a lot depends on how the police respond. But there's a difference between the police response to protest in democracies and the response in non-democracies. In non-democracies, the regime generally shoots to kill. They treat protest as a treasonous danger that must be extirpated in the harshest possible terms to teach a lesson. In democracies, protest is usually met with non-lethal force and with an attempt to bargain with the leaders. There may be mass arrests, there may be police beatings in extreme cases, but generally lethal force is avoided and the goal is some kind of accommodation. And what's interesting to me is both in Russia and China today, we're seeing a very different response to protest than we would have seen, say, in Tiananmen Square in 89. So I do think the nature of uh, response to protest is changing in ways that suggest some tactical retreat on the part of even authoritarian regimes. So I, I, I also would uh, add two words. So uh, mm, I think we need to distinguish between the problem of class composition of protest and dynamic uh, aspect of class formation. So in, in Russia, I think if we uh, cannot say that uh, this is protest of middle class, that the middle class uh, is a subject of uh, the protest, but we can say that uh, the middle class formation process uh, was a very important mechanism uh, contributed to the emergence of, of, of the protest. So I think uh, uh, it's important. So we will, I think that's uh, what I'm trying, trying to say. I mean, good for you. Uh, <laughs>